Oke, okay, sudah di-admit, Pak Edi. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, we, can, we can start now, ya. Yeah. Oke, okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And also good morning, especially for Professor Sir Martin Herrer. Welcome to uh, our Mathematics Distinguished Lecture Series. This is the first edition of the second year of this event. We are very grateful to welcome the Rector of the Institute Technology Bandung, Professor Reni Wirahadi Kusuma, and the Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences Institute Technology Bandung, Professor Wahyu Sri Kutomo. Of course, we are all very happy and excited to welcome our special speaker today, uh, Professor Sir Martin Herrer. He is a professor in mathematics at the Imperial College, uh, London, United Kingdom. He received a Field Medal Laureate 2014 and Mathematics Breakthrough Prize Laureate in 2021, I think. And recently, he received also King Faisal Award in 2022. We are very honored and grateful to have Professor Sir Martin Herrer, one of the world's most uh, prominent mathematicians. Our big warm welcome also goes to all colleagues and students for attending this program. Thank you very much for your enthusiasm and we really appreciate it. Hello, Professor Harrier. How are you? <laughs> Very well, thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm really uh, sorry. Maybe I wake you up a uh, little bit uh, early in the morning this today. <laughs> and thank, thank you for receiving uh, our invitation. And thank you for having time uh, for us today. I remember last time in 2016, you enjoyed very much uh, uh, seeing a Balinese dance in uh, <laughs> Nusa Dua, right? We had you in Bali for Asian uh, Mathematics Conference. That's right. And I, and I hope uh, next time you can visit us in Bandung. Mm. Okay, uh, and I would like to mention that uh, the audience uh, here are not only uh, from Indonesia, but also from uh, neighboring countries. Yeah. As uh, we can see yeah, here, yeah, we have uh, around yeah, 160 people yeah, in the participant. Yeah. And they are from Philippines, Thailand, and then Malaysia, uh, some from Japan, from even from Australia, and of course from Indonesia and from other countries. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, this Mathematics Distinguished Lecture Series is organized by the Department of Mathematics, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences Institute of Technology, Bandung. And now, uh, today we are all very excited and honored to have Professor Sir Martin Herr from Imperial College, uh, London, United Kingdom. And his talk will be chaired by Dr. Yudi Suwariadi. But before I hand it over to Dr. Yudi, I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Professor Wahyu Sri Kutomo, to give a welcoming speech. Professor Wahyu? The time is yours. Thank you, Pak. Uh, thank you, Pak Edi. Uh, uh, Salamu alaikum. Uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, welcome to the first lecture, actually, of the season two of the ITB Mathematics uh, Distinguished Lecture Series, hosted by the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Institute Technology Bandung, uh, Indonesia. Uh, I am Wahyu Sri Gutomo, uh, 
currently the Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. I'm surprisingly delighted to preview the list of guests registered for this occasion. Among them, dignitaries, professors, mathematicians, scientists, engineers, students of all spectrum. Uh, brought together for the course of this lecture series. And here's uh, an, appreciat an appreciative uh, welcome to you all. First of all, I would like to thanks uh, to uh, the Rector of ITB, Professor Raini Wirahadi Kusuma, for her willingness to attend and open this valuable event. It is an honor for us, uh, the Rector of ITB, to be, pre to be present together. Uh, and we become more motivated and excited to participate in this event. We also hope that this event can be a bridge uh, for further collaboration. Uh, and let me express my profound appreciation to the organizer uh, and especially to Professor Eddie Tri Bascoro, Pa Eddie and his team for all the efforts and the initiation of bringing renowned mathematician to ITB. This initiation is truly consistent uh, uh, to the spirit of the faculty to become a beacon of knowledge of science nationally, regionally, and uh, beyond, of course. And of course, my deepest appreciation and gratitude today goes to our esteemed guest, Professor Sir Martin Heyer of the College of London, UK, for bringing his expertise and friendship to ITB. Uh, Professor Heyer, uh, infinite gratitude to you for taking your time, uh, sharing your extensive experience with us. Uh, you are among a rare uh, breed of mathematicians with uh, eagle eyes that can view and even preview the large uh, swath landscape of mathematics and science. I am myself a physicist by training. I am aware of mathematics is not the easiest science to communicate to a wide spectrum of audience. Um, we hope to learn from your experience of doing research at a very high level. As you mentioned in your abstract, probability theory as it touches uh, uh, says almost every aspect of science. We are eager to learn from you, from your experience. And uh, in this series, uh, we hope to highlight the, the best and uh, the many facets of mathematics from the very people uh, who are carrying the torch of mathematics intriguing mathematics, inspiring mathematics. Along the way, we are hopeful also, we are, we are hopeful that the spirit will infect many soul touched by, uh, by it. And uh, of course, this is also will be very valuable uh, experience and a moment for our young students and our young researchers. Once again, thank you very much. And I hope that uh, you will enjoy, uh, you will all, uh, enjoy Professor Hayra's lecture today. Thank you very much. Salamu alaikum. Thank you, Paidi well, and Professor uh, Martin. Okay, thank <coughs> you, uh, Prof. Ayu. And now uh, we would like to listen uh, the welcoming speech from the Rector of ITB, Professor Reni Wirahadi Kusuma. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to the audiences, participants accessing this lecture from various time zones of the world. Greetings, warmest greetings from Bandung, Indonesia, our campus, Institute Technology Bandung. It is a pleasure for me to greet and virtually meet you all in this special occasion of the ITB Mathematics Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you all for uh, spending time with us. Thank you all for coming. First of all, it is again a real honor for us, for me, 
uh, to have an extraordinary speaker to commence the second year of lecture series, Sir Professor Martin Aaron of the Imperial College of London. Sir Martin is a world leading expert in probability theory, stochastic partial differential equations, is also a Fields Medal and a Breakthrough in Mathematics Award laureate. We gratefully thank Sir Martin for this opportunity of learning experience. Institute Technology Bandung, as a leading science, technology, and art institution in Indonesia, we are always striving to be a globally respected but also, most importantly, locally relevant learning institution. So we innovate with technology to make a significant contribution and to rise up to global challenges, which face us as a nation and also as global citizens. Science, including mathematics, it is indeed the driving force behind technological advances. So we always strongly support science in ITB for a hundred years and beyond. Science and mathematics have been an essential component of ITB, of this institute. And in fact, a very dynamic and productive indeed. So my colleagues in mathematics department are uh, very uh, dynamic and very productive scientists. Uh, this series of distinguished lectures is uh, a sign of that. So it is a vigorous sign of life from the science and mathematics corners of ITB. I applaud, congratulate the Faculty of Mathematics and other Natural Sciences, uh, especially the Dean, uh, Professor Wahyu Sri Gutomo, and his uh, wonderful team for consistently and uh, for consistently supporting and hosting distinguished lectures from renowned scientists, Nobel Prize laureates, Field Medal laureates, such as Professor, uh, Professor Sir Martin, uh, by bringing lots of motivation, lots of ideas to our students, our faculty member, uh, both in ITB and uh, many universities all over Indonesia and the uh, scientific community uh, in Indonesia. Uh, I particularly would like to thank Professor Eddie Tribarskoro, my uh, colleagues, my friend, for initiating this series of Mathematics Distinguished Lectures, which is now entering the second year. So hopefully this will continue in the years to come. Uh, again, thank you, Professor Erer, again for the opportunities to learn and experience the recent progress in mathematics. We sincerely hope that we would be able to host you again in person. I would really meet you in person in Bandung, uh, hopefully in the not too long future, and uh, therefore would open up more possibilities of fruitful collaboration with a very uh, prominent uh, person such as yourself. So I hope you would uh, respond to our uh, invitation uh, for coming back to ITB again in the near future. And for the audiences, uh, participants, thank you again with the hope that you can enjoy and learn as much as possible from our distinguished guest, Sir Professor Martin Herrero. Thank you for your kind attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, so uh, now before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Yudi, uh, let us uh, have a group photo first. Uh, silakan, Pak Rudy. Okay, uh, thank you, Pak Edi and uh, Sir Martin. Hello, everyone. I'd like uh, to take a picture, all of us here, but unfortunately, because, uh, uh, no, fortunately, because we have uh, many participants here, uh, and there is uh, nine pages of the uh, Zoom meeting. So I suggest you take your uh, picture yourself, but I will take only the, the first uh, four pages here, okay? 
So I will take the, the first pages now. Uh, one, uh, two, three. Okay, the second pages. One, two, three. Uh, and then the third one. One, two, three. And then, I'm sorry, I just going to take the, the fourth one here. Okay, here the uh, fourth pages, one, two, three. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Pai okay. and Sir Martin. Yeah. Terima kasih, uh, Pak Rudy. And now I like to ask uh, Dr. Yudi to share uh, the session. Are you there? Ah. Masih mute. Okay. I mean, I'm mute and let's see. Let me just... Just work. Suaranya masih mute, Pak Yudi. Sudah, sudah mute. Okay. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Bandung. Um, it is really an honor to have a our uh, uh, esteemed guest for, for today. For the this is the lecture one of the second year of our. ITB Mathematics Distinguished Lecture Series. So my name is Yudi Suharyadi. And first of all, I would like to uh, give an introduction to our, uh, our guests, just a short introductions. So, so our guest is Professor Sir Martin Hare of the Imperial College of London, UK. So I would like to remind you uh, first, maybe that you please mute your microphone uh, at all time. That's in, we are in Zoom sessions. Uh, later on, regarding the Q and A, please write down your question in chat section of the Zoom. So I will read your questions selectively, if necessary, for the speaker to answer. Okay. okay so here's our guest. Uh, Sir Martin Hare, he is the professor, chair in probability and stochastic analysis, Imperial College of London. He um, obtained his PhD in physics and master in physics, and all in also the bachelor's degree in mathematics from University of Geneva. And he is currently the chair of probability and uh, stochastic analysis, Imperial College from 2017. Uh, previously, he is a Regis Professor of Mathematics, University of Warwick from 2014, 2017. And uh, before that, he was, he uh, had a serial career from lecturer, assistant professor, associate professor, and professor in the University of Warwick since 2004. And among the among the uh, many awards that he that he uh, obtained is the 2022 King Faisal Prize, 2020 Mathematics Breakthrough Prize, 2014 Fields Medal, 2014 Froehlich Prize, 2013 Fermat Prize, 2008 Phillips Leverhulm Prize. Well, the I didn't mention all of these. He got a long list of the awards. And honors, for honors. Uh, in 2019, uh, he was knighted as a British Knight Commander of British uh, Empire, KBE. Uh, he has a foreign, foreign associate member, member of the Academy of Sciences various distinguished lectures, name lectures, 
uh, in the last, well, uh, the last couple of years. So, um, I think most importantly, I would like to uh, mention a little bit of what uh, uh, Sir Martin's accomplishments, mostly the citations, this is uh, cited for the uh, contributions for the in stochastic partial differential equations in uh, for the Fields Medal. So he is cited for outstanding contributions to the theory of stochastic partial differential equations, and in the particular, for the creation of the theory of regularity structure for such equations. Uh, so the, with the new theory, it allows him to construct systematic solution to singular nonlinear SPDEs as a fixed point of the renormalization procedure. So he was able to give for the first time rigorous intrinsic meaning to many SPDE arising in physics. So without further ado, I would like to uh, give the podium to Martin. So without further ado, I would like to uh, let uh, Sir Martin to take over the podium and deliver his talk. So I'll stop share and Martin, please, the, you can share your, uh, your slide. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, and uh, well, thank you all for, for coming today. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's great to have such a big audience. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, uh, well, as you see from the title of the lecture is universality in probability theory. And for that, let me first start with, you know, sort of uh, like go back at the kind of very uh, basic sort of principles uh, in probability. And you see, so when you, when you tell people that you're probabilist, then often people think that sort of as a probabilist, you're able to, you know, make some kind of magical predictions <laughs> uh, about what's going to happen in the future, which is obviously not true. Um, and the only thing that we can do as probabilists is in some sense, we can try to predict probabilities of certain things happening, but at the end of the day, we can mostly transform probabilities, right? We cannot just pull them out of thin air. Um, and so, so we need some kind of starting point, right? So, so we need some kind of principle that first allows us to assign probabilities in simple settings or to maybe simpler events and that we can then transform and you know, use in order to uh, try to compute probabilities of more interesting events. And there are basically two such guiding principles. So the first one is symmetry. And that's all quite clear, isn't it? So it basically says, if you take a, <clears throat> you make some kind of probabilistic experiment, uh, mean experiment really in the sort of large sense. And if you have a situation where there are different possible outcomes, so you can distinguish the possible outcomes, but from the perspective of the experiment, so from the perspective of the mechanism causing the outcomes, they are completely indistinguishable, right? So there's no reason why one of them should be more favored uh, over another one, because as far as the mechanism of the experiment is concerned, the outcomes seem to be completely identical. And in that case, well, all of these outcomes should be assigned the same probability, right? So that's intuitively quite clear. And of course, the basic example is a coin toss. And right? so if you toss a coin, there are two possible outcomes, <clears throat> which is uh, heads or tails. And you can tell the difference because you can see the difference between the two faces of the coin, but, you know, if you toss the coin as far as the mechanism of the coin rotating, if the coin is well balanced, you know, at least to kind of very high approximation, 
uh, that mechanism doesn't see the difference between the two faces of the coin, right? I mean, of course, in reality, it does a little bit because the coin is not exactly symmetric, but to very high accuracy, it's symmetric, right? Um, and therefore, it's very natural to assign probability a half to both possible outcomes, head and face. Um, now, there's a second guiding principle, which uh, is maybe a little bit more uh, slightly mysterious, if you want, which, people, which goes under the name of universality. And what that means is, in a way, very often, if you have a random experiment where the outcome is a consequence of many different sources of randomness that sort of interact together, and they interact in a somewhat homogeneous way, in the sense that like the different independent random sources, they, they all have similar type of influences on the outcome, right? Um, in that type of situation, very often the, um, the law of the outcome, or at least many features of the law of the outcome, don't really depend much of the details of the mechanism that produces them. It sort of depends on the, if you want the high level description, but it doesn't depend very much on the low level description. And that's sort of, as mathematicians, it sort of goes a bit against what one usually does, right? Because in mathematics, it's of course extremely important to describe things extremely precisely, right? So a mathematical model, sometimes you have to describe it completely. You have to say exactly what happens. Um, you cannot just say sort of approximately what happens. If you just say something approximately, it's not really a mathematical model, right? But this principle of universality says that actually, uh, in many respects, it should be actually enough to give some kind of course description of what happens. And you don't really need to bother too much with the details. Uh, and that should be sufficient in order to actually predict um, the probabilities of outcomes. And so one, the example of universality that you've probably many of you have seen is the central limit theorem, right? So the central limit theorem basically says that if you add independent quantities um, and then you, know, you take the outcome and you sort of recenter it in such a way that you, know, you change units in such a way that the outcome has order one, then the probability distribution of the outcome is always going to follow this kind of bell-shaped curve here, which is the Gaussian distribution. Um, so here, what I've plotted here is essentially what do you get if you do a thousand coin tosses, right? So if I do a thousand coin tosses and then I count, um, I, sorry, no, how does it work? I do 10,000, I do a hundred thousand coin tosses here. So what do I do? So I do bits of a hundred coin tosses, right? And then I, I do the hundred coin tosses, I count how many heads, how many tails. So mostly it's going to be about 50-50, right? Um, and then you plot, you do that experiment many times. And then you look at, you do a statistics of what are the outcomes that you get, right? So most of the time you get something around 50 heads, which is the, so the center here would be 50 and here would be 51, 52, 53, and so on. And you see that, well, you get this distribution, which more or less follows this Gaussian distribution. But if you do it more times, say 10,000, then you see it already follows much more closely. If I do it a hundred thousand times, then it, you know, it's sort of dead on, right? So it's clear that if you sort of repeat this experiment more and more often, it's going to get closer and closer uh, to this Gaussian probability distribution. And this doesn't depend very much on the details, right? So here I've done some kind of statistics of coin tosses. I mean, obviously I didn't toss the coin myself. I just you know, wrote a little computer program that generates random numbers. Um, you could have done very other similar things, right? So as long as if you roll dices and you add up the numbers that you get when you roll dices, and then again, you do a statistics of that over many, uh, many runs of the experiment, you'll get it's a very similar type of statistics, 
Okay. Um, and so, so that's of course the central limit theorem. And well, because that central limit theorem is so general, right? So the pretty much the only assumption you need is some kind of independence. So there are version of the central limit theorem where you don't even need really independence. You need some kind of weak dependence and you need that sort of different, the quantities that you add, each of them has a somewhat small influence on the outcome. As soon as that's true, you're going to converge to a Gaussian distribution, right? So this Gaussian distribution has some kind of universal character in the sense that it shows up very often in many different types of statistics, okay? Independently of what, it, what are the precise details of the mechanism that causes it. Um, so now let me, um, oh, I think the movie doesn't show up. So, okay, so let me just give you now a slightly more sophisticated example of this universality. And that goes back to the early 19th century where uh, Robert Brown, or actually even earlier, 50 years earlier, Jan Igenhus, who was a Dutch uh, biology uh, doctor, I think he was, a, he was a medical doctor. Robert Brown was a biologist. Um, so they observed under the microscope very small particles. So in Egenhus's case, it was coal dust uh, that was suspended in alcohol. In the case of Brown, it was uh, little pollen particles that were suspended in water. They were looking at these small particles under the microscope. And what they noticed is that you actually see them moving. And they saw them, they see them moving around. So, um, yeah, it should have shown the movie here, but somehow the movie doesn't show up. Um, but basically you would look at the microscope, you have one of these little particles and you see it perform a rather erratic motion like this, right? So it essentially looks like this as a function of time. It does something like that. Um, and at the time it was really not clear why that would be the case, right? So why would these particles move? Even though, you know, they made sure that the water itself is not moving anymore. They were careful about isolating it from the outside. So there was not no kind of external influence. Um, they also in the beginning thought that maybe, well, at least Robert Brown for these pollen particles in the beginning, he maybe he thought that they were maybe alive, um, but then, you know, he left it for several days. And then if it had been alive, they would have been dead by then, they would still move. Um, of course, what Pitbull figured out in the end is that the mechanism is that, well, you have your particle, your pollen or grain of coal dust uh, that's suspended in your liquid. And the liquid is made of molecules, right? So you have water molecules uh, all over the place. Um, and these water molecules, they actually move in all directions. They behave a little bit like little billiard balls, right? So if they move in straight lines and they kind of bounce off each other. Um, and in particular, they also bounce off these particles, right? So you'd have these water molecules that bombard um, the large particle and bounce off it. And whenever a water molecule bounces off it, that gives it a little push in some direction, right? Now, of course, you know, a water molecule is really tiny, tiny. Uh, so you don't see these pushes individually, but there's so many of them and they, they bump into it so often, so frequently that, you know, all these tiny little pushes that are too small to see, they add up to something that you can actually see, right? So they add up to a motion that you can actually see under a microscope. Um, and so in order to describe that, well, one tool that was so quite important was, uh, was discovered by, uh, by Fourier. So Fourier was a French scientist. And interestingly, so he was a very good mathematician, uh, but he was also quite a good politician, which is uh, not very frequent. And, he actually took part in Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in the, in the late 1700s. 
And he spent some time, I think he was director of a museum in Cairo. Um, and then when he came back, he became prefect of Isère, which is one of the departments in France. So it's like a kind of local, uh, local politician there. But from a mathematical point of view, he's mostly remembered for two uh, important contributions. So the first one is the Fourier transform, uh, which of course you all know about, which essentially says that if you have a, you know, that any function can be written as a you know, superposition of sine waves, of pure waves. And the other uh, important contribution, which is going to be more relevant uh, here today is what's called Fourier's law. So Fourier's law is, well, the discovery of the heat equation. So it's the equation that describes the evolution of heat in, in a solid body, right? And so here U uh, would be a function, right? So U here is a function of two variables. So there's time and space. Uh, the space variable takes values in, you know, whatever domain of space the solid that you're describing occupies. Um, and the equation, and then U at a point in time and a point in space gives you the temperature uh, at that location at a given time. And what he found out, uh, what he derived is the evolution of this temperature field. And that's just given by this heat equation here, which is that the time derivative is equal to a constant, uh, which is called the uh, thermal conductivity times the spatial Laplacian of U, the sum of the second derivatives of U. Now, why is that important? Because, well, in the early 1900s, so in 1995, 96, independently Einstein and Smoluchowski, they actually got interested in describing Brownian motion. And so until at the time, so remember Brown was in the, er, in the 1820s, right? So this is about 80 years later. So for 80 years, people didn't actually have a definitive explanation of Brownian motion, right? So the explanation that I gave you with the molecules that kind of bounce off the particles that make them move, that explanation was only discovered, you know, quite a bit later. Um, and what Einstein and Smoluchowski did is, well, they took that explanation and they tried to make it quantitative, right? So they tried to make it sufficiently precise in order to actually derive predictions about at least the statistical behavior of these uh, pollen particles or these grains of dust that you would, you know, that are sufficiently good. So you could do an actual, you know, real experiment to measure things. And um, the re so the reason why they were so interested in that is that even at the time, so remember, so that's, it's not that long ago, right? I mean, it's just a little bit over a hundred years ago. Um, so at that time, although it was already relatively well accepted that matter was made of atoms and molecules, it wasn't completely settled, right? So it was still something that people were debating um, and not everybody was convinced that matter is made of molecules and atoms. And in particular, there hadn't been yet an experiment for which you couldn't come up with any other explanation, right? So all the experiments they had, they were consistent with the fact that matter is made of atom, but you could also explain them in different ways, right? Um, whereas here, you know, these quantitative predictions for the um, diffusion of you know, pollen in water, or dust, coal dust in alcohol. Um, so they were derived from first principle using the assumption that um, matter is made of atoms and molecules. So there was no alternative explanation, right? And so the idea is that, well, if you could extract something some measurable prediction out of that, and you could do the experiment, um, and the experiment matches the prediction, then that's basically proof that matter is made of atoms and molecules because you really use that in order to produce the 
prediction and there's no other way of describing it. Um, and so the prediction that they came up with is essentially that the probability distribution of the position of the particle is described by the heat equation, right? So if now you take that same equation uh, we had before, this heat equation, but now instead of interpreting U as being the temperature at a location X at time T, you interpret U as being the probability that at time T, you see your particle at location X, right? So you interpret the U as a probability distribution for any fixed time uh, as a probability distribution over space instead of interpreting it as a temperature. And what they figured out is that this probability distribution should actually satisfy exactly the same equation as the one that Fourier uh, had derived 100 years earlier for the uh, propagation of heat. And, and in particular, they could actually predict the value of this constant here, right? So that's the important thing that you could actually measure experimentally, right? So you have this prediction that not only does this probability follow this equation, but you actually could predict what the value of that constant C is. If you knew, you know, the size of your particles, their weight, the viscosity of the water and so on. So if you knew all of these things that you could measure separately, then as a function of all of that, you could actually predict the value of this constant. Um, and so Perrin actually a couple of years later, so it was 1908, uh, so just two years later, he actually did the experiment. So he was a, a French physicist. So he did the experiment. He wrote a beautiful treatise about it, uh, which you can still, you can find it online. You can read it actually, it's a, a recommend. Um, and it really matched, right? It matched the prediction to within, I think about 10% or something like that. But it's somehow, I mean, given how the experiment was made up, it was actually a really quite good match. And, and so that was really, it's widely considered as being like the experiment that actually settled uh, the debate about the existence of atom, right? Because there was just no other explanation for it. Um, now, interestingly, there was another um, scientist, well, mathematician actually, who Around the same time, so that was in 1900, so it was just five years before Einstein and Smoloshovsky, um, Bachelier, he was interested in something completely different. And so what Bachelier was interested in was uh, explaining how stock prices evolve, right? So at the time there was already trades in shares of companies um, and well, so he was interested in uh, describing the evolution or describing the mechanism that makes the stock prices change. And he wrote his thesis on that topic. Um, it didn't do him that much good. So <laughs> he was in some sense very much in advance on his time um, and the mathematicians of his time, so somehow the French probabilists of the early 1900s, so like Paul Lévy or this kind of, you know, the great French probabilists of the early 1900s, they were not terribly impressed uh, by his work. And they thought, you know, mathematics shouldn't be used for, you know, these kind of dirty business of, you know, just describing money and that kind of things. And, and so he actually had quite a hard time finding a job. Um, so he got a position at the Sorbonne, so the Paris University, not too long after his thesis, but then uh, World War I came and so then everything got disrupted and he didn't actually get his job back. Um, and in the end, he got his permanent, first permanent position only you know, in his late fifties, um, I think it was in Bordeaux. Um, and so what did he do? So, so the mechanism that he describes for the evolution of stock prices is the following. So it's basically, you know, it's the mechanism that we sort of all know. So, you know, there are many people who trade uh, these stocks. If somebody wants to sell a stock, well, that pushes the price um, down a little bit. Right? 
And if somebody wants to buy stock, well, that pushes prices up because people realize that somebody, somebody is trying to buy the stock. And so they think they, could, they would be able to sell it for a higher price. Right? And so it's somewhat similar mechanism to the one I described earlier for the evolution of these pollen particles in water, right? I mean, there's, think of the stock price as being the pollen particle and of people trading stocks as being the water molecules and the water molecule bumping into um, the, um, bumping into the pollen particle, that would be somebody doing a trade. Right? And, and the trade can go two ways. It can either be a sale or it can be a buy. Uh, and depending which way it go, goes, it pushes the price either slightly up or slightly down. Now, of course, for, again, for most people, they would trade small quantities. And so if you and I you know, sell a couple thousand dollars worth of stock, that's not going to affect the price much. Right? But it's going to affect it maybe in some kind of tiny infinitesimal way. Uh, and there are many, many people making many of these trades. Uh, and so altogether, it does actually have an effect that you see. And you see the evolution of the stock prices and in, in absence of kind of, you know, big systemic shocks. Uh, what you would see is something, you know, that sort of looks something like that, right? As a, for the stock price as a function of time. Um, and again, he saw that you know, mathematically, if you want to describe the evolution of, again, the probability distribution, now it's a probability distribution on prices right, rather than on spatial locations. Uh, but that probability distribution on prices, again, as a function of time, it's actually, at least you know, in some regimes, it's quite well described by the heat equation. And that basically led foundations for you know, the Black-Scholes model, uh, which then came much, much later, right? So that's in the 1970s. Um, so in some sense, he was sort of the founder of modern quantitative finance, but you know, 70 years before his time, basically. Now, you see in both cases, we have the heat equation that shows up in a way. And in both cases, we have these sort of random trajectories, right? So the traje random trajectory would either be a trajectory in space for these particles that move around or a trajectory in price, prime, in price space instead of real space, right? Which is one dimensional and that would be sort of stock price, right? Um, and this heat equation only provides if you want a very coarse summary of that, right? It just tells you what is the probability of seeing something at a given time, but it doesn't actually tell you, you know, what do these trajectories actually look like as trajectories. Uh, and for this, we've actually had to wait until Wiener um, in the late 20s, who really describes a probability measure on the space of continuous functions which is naturally associated to the heat equation. Um, and that's called, well, now it's called either the Brownian motion measure, you know, because of Brown, or the Wiener measure because of Wiener. Um, and actually, well, right, so here is an example, right? So this is a sample path of this Brownian motion. And, you know, I mean, if you look at sort of locally also like, Think of like stock prices, it kind of looks quite similar, right? It has similar kind of features. Um, and Donska in, this, in the 50s, so he proved the first, if you want, like functional central limit theorem, right? So it's essentially like a central limit theorem, but where instead of just looking at one quantity, uh, you look really at trajectories and you show that, you know, whenever you have a trajectory which is created by a mechanism like the one I just described, where in some sense there are lots of independent little events that affect your trajectory and that kind of push it in one direction or the other. And then you look at what happens, you know, at very large scales for very large times, um, then you can, you know, you can turn this into a proper mathematical statement that you, you can prove that there is a limit and the limit is always this Brownian motion measure. 
Now, this was one dimensional, right? So, so here, it was always trajectories where there's a time and then the trajectory moves. Maybe space could be more than one dimensional, right? So here I draw a trajectory in two dimensional space, but it's, all, it's just a curve, right? So it's parametrized by one parameter. So you can ask yourself, you know, is there like a two parameter version of Brownian motion? Is there a natural thing like that? So for example, one way of producing a Brownian motion is just by a random walk and the random walk, one way of thinking of a random walk is to uh, say, well, I take any function, right? A random walk is just any function. Let me just draw an example, which from the integers to the integers, which has the property that from one integer to the next, it moves either by exactly plus one or exactly minus one, right? And then you just pick one such function at random. You say, okay, they all have the same probability. I just pick one at random. Uh, and if you do that and you look at it at large scales, again, you get this Brownian motion. So you could do the same thing in two dimensions, right? So you take a lattice, for example, this honeycomb lattice, and then say, okay, so I take a random function on the lattice, so a function that assigns a number to each one of these vertices uh, in such a way that the difference between the values at neighboring vertices is always exactly plus one or minus one, right? So if the value is two here, then here it has to be either one or three and so on. Okay, so, so you can do that and you can draw one such function at random. Um, and then you can ask yourself, you know, what does this actually look like? Mm -hmm. Is there uh, something else I can help with? Sorry, that was Siri. Uh, <laughs> you can ask yourself, what does this look like at large scales? And then so this, well, there is a conjecture of what it looks like. So it is again, something which is described by Gaussian distributions. It's called the free field. Um, so here is a simulation. Well, so the left one is a simulation of precisely the thing that I just described, this honeycomb lattices, and you take a random function which differs by plus minus one on neighboring vertices. Uh, and on the right is a simulation of the free field. Okay. And okay, I tried to match the color scheme. So the color scheme don't quite match, but they sort of roughly match. You sort of see that they have, it's a similar kind of feature, right? Looks somewhat similar. Uh, the conjecture is that they really have the same, that this guy in the limit, in a large scale limit should really be behave in the same way as this guy here. And, but this is already a more complicated object because this is a Gaussian, it's not, it's not even a function actually, right? So, the, so what happens here is that uh, the correct way, so first the correct way of scaling things is quite different. So in the case of Brownian motion, when you, when you take a random walk, right? The central limit theorem tells you that after n steps, your random walk will move by about square root of n. And so the correct way of looking at what happens at large scales is to rescale horizontally by n and vertically by square root of n, so that things are of order one. Uh, so that's the square root comes from the square root in the central limit theorem. Here, the correct way of rescaling is to just not rescale at all vertically. You rescale horizontally by n and you don't rescale at all vertically. But it turns out that values still get arbitrarily large. Okay, and so if you don't rescale vertically, then in the limit, you get something that can actually take, if you want, plus and minus infinitely large values. Uh, and so you don't actually get a function in the limit, but it turns out you still get a distribution in the limit. So you get a random distribution and you can still describe its correlation function. That should just be a log, just log of the difference. Uh, but you see the log actually blows up at the origin. Right, so it means that here the expectation of h of x square would be infinity. Right, so that's what tells you that it's not actually a random function. Right, so you sort of think of it as a random function, but it really is only a random distribution. It's not really a random function. Um, but this, these sort of statements, so like remember Donska had this quite general statement about convergence to uh, Brownian motion, and that was in the 50s. So that was 70 years ago already. 
Here, this is something which a priori looks very similar. The limiting object that you get is still Gaussian. You have an explicit correlation function. So it is also something you know, similarly easy to describe as Brownian motion. But proving these kind of results is infinitely harder. So, so even like for this particular case of the honeycomb lattice, I'm not 100% sure that there even is a mathematically rigorous theorem that says they converges to the free field. There are certainly some for very similar models, uh, like these Daimler models, for example. Um, so here there are some people like Rick Kenyon or Fabio Toninelli or Kurt Johansson. So that's all of the people who have worked on these type of problems. But this is very recent works, right? So these are people who are, you know, alive and not old, right? I mean, that sort of works over the last 10, 20 years. Right? Um, so, so then now this was still what we would call like a free model, right? In the sense that you put some constraints. So here I take functions on the honeycomb lattice where uh, the difference between neighboring values is equal to plus minus one. So you have some constraint, but then you just pick one of them at random. You give them all the same probability, right? So that's what people would sort of call this a free model. And they are usually described by by Gaussian distributions or somehow Gaussian distributions show up in the description of free models. Um, but then there are of course, you know, many interesting models that show up in physics are not free model. You don't just have constraints, uh, but you also have like energetic considerations you want, All right? So the simplest such model is the easing model, for example. So the easing model, here it's a model where, um, so this time you're, so in this case, it's again, two dimensional model. You can do it of course in higher dimension. I just look at the two dimensional one here and the two dimensional one is particularly interesting. Um, and so here you lay, take a two dimensional lattice and to each point of the lattice, you assign a value and the value is only either plus one or minus one, right? So this time it's just plus or minus, or minus one at each lattice and I draw it sort of either yellow or black. Um, but now instead of just drawing one such configuration at random, you draw it, uh, well, still at random, but not equal probabilities. You, to, you say that the probability of a configuration is actually proportional to this quantity here, where this wiggle sign here means you, you look at the sum which is goes over pairs X and Y, which are nearest neighbors in the lattice, right? So you just say that, well, you look at all possible nearest neighbors and you look at the product uh, of the values. Uh, and then you multiply this by some constant, which is interpreted as an inverse temperature and you exponentiate this. And this is your probability or the probability is proportional to that because you normalize it so that the total probability is one. Um, and you see, so that makes, if the two neighbors have the same value, right? If sigma x is equal to sigma y, then this is plus one. And if sigma x is different from sigma y, then this is minus one, right? And so the exponential here is either exponential of something positive or something negative. And so it means, well, it means that the probability is higher to see something where neighboring spins tend to have the same value, right? But of course, you know, there is a competition here between sort of energy and entropy, because then you would say, oh, so then what I'm going to see with highest probability, what I'm going to see is the configuration where all the spins have exactly the same value, right? Yes, so that is going to be the configuration that has the highest probability. But of course, there are many, many configurations, right? And so you're still actually never going to see that one, right? So it's much more likely that you see a configuration that looks a bit like this, for example, where most of them have the same value, but then there are some that have a different value. It turns out that what you see really depends very crucially on this parameter beta, um, which is one over the temperature. And so here, these three pictures are kind of what you typically see either at low temperature. So the low temperature means large beta, right? So if beta is large, then this weight in some sense is very important, right? And that means that, you know, neighboring values very strongly want to be the same, 
Right? And then you tend to see something like this, where most of them have the same value and then some of them have a bit of different value. But then as you increase the temperature, if the temperature is very high, so beta is very small, then in some sense, this value doesn't matter so much. And you see something like this. So this is very close to what you would see if you just pick the values at random, right? If you just put beta equals zero and you somehow don't give a weight at all, then you would also see something roughly like that. And there's a transition in between. So there's a critical value of beta where what you see is something like this. Right? And this is very interesting. So you have somehow large regions where it looks more yellow, but in these yellow regions, you still have quite large black regions, and they themselves are contained in larger black regions, which themselves contain very large yellow regions and so on. So you have this kind of fractal structure of these black and yellow regions that are kind of intermingled uh, with each other, right? Um, and so, so what people try to understand is, for example, you know, what does this guy here look like if you look at it at very large scales? You know, does this have some kind of scaling limit? Is there an interesting universal object that's associated to that? Um, and then again, so here, this is very recent. So there's a very recent result by Garbon, uh, Chuck Newman, and another two collaborators or so, where they actually prove, but it, it relies on earlier works by Cardi and sort of the theoretical physicists. Um, but the mathematically rigorous result is very recent, where they actually prove that at this critical temperature, this easing limit really has a scaling limit and there is a limiting object, but that limiting object is really not Gaussian. Um, and it's, uh, well, one doesn't have a good explicit description. One has somehow explicit description of correlation functions or so, but one doesn't have explicit descriptions of the laws. Uh, but again, there's a conjecture that this is actually quite universal for large classes of models that have similar type of features as this easing model, right? But this time it's sort of interacting models. Uh, where it has similar features in the sense that, you know, it describes two phases and the phases want to be, right, sort of the, the mix, intermix. Um, and every kind of model that describes a situation like that at the, should have a critical temperature and at the critical temperature, its large scale behavior should be the same as the one for this easy model. So, so what's the situation now, right? So the situation in general is that you have this, what people call universality classes, right? So like the easing model would be one universality class and this free field is in a different universality class and the Brownian motion is yet another universality class. Um, but there are, some sense what one expects is that there are relatively few of these universality classes um, and that, you know, many models. So, you know, all of these models of somewhat models of statistical mechanics of, of interacting systems um, should have some large scale limit and the large scale limit should be described by one of these relatively few uh, universality classes. Right? And now, of course, as a mathematician, therefore, what you would really want to do is you would have some kind of, you know, mathematical classification kind of theorem that tells you, you know, what are all the possible limiting objects that can possibly arise, like in any dimension. Also. Um, and well, such a classification doesn't exist yet. Okay. Um, but one can try to ask at least, you know, what are some of the features that you would want to see? So in general, so we've seen two examples that were Gaussian. So Gaussian uh, examples are of course important here, but in general, when you have interactions like in this easing model, uh, then you do not expect to see Gaussian limits in general. What you do have is some self-similarity because you obtain these objects by taking a model and then looking at what happens at large scale. So you do some scaling limit 
And so you obtain it as a limit of some rescaling operations, and therefore it has to be itself a fixed point of some rescaling operation, right? So it has to have some scaling variance of self-similarity, if you want. Um, in many cases, you expect rotation invariance in two dimensions, or you know, in three dimensions, you also expect some kind of rotation invariance if your models are somewhat isotropic. Uh, now, if you have scale invariance and rotation invariance, then it's actually quite natural to expect conformal invariance, right? Because conformal transformations are those that locally look like the composition of a rotation and the scaling. So, and in two dimensions, this is actually an insight that has produced, that has been extremely fruitful over, I guess, the last 50 years or so. Um, and there's another, another property that you expect is to have some kind of Markov property. So what this means is that, you know, since all of the models I've described to you so far, the rules that describe the model were kind of quite local rules. Right? So they don't really see what happens far away. They just describe you know, what happens locally in some configuration. You sort of look at your neighbors or something like that. Um, and that means that what you'd expect in general is that if you, you, know, if you take some region of space and you look at what happens inside this region, then maybe it depends on, you know, you can sort of, it depends on what happens sort of like on the boundary of this region, but it should not depend on what happens, you know, like outside of this region. In some sense, the, if you know what happens on the boundary, then what happens outside here should not be relevant for describing what happens inside because of the locality of the interaction, right? Uh, and if that's true, then one says the system has a Markov property or spatial Markov property, if you want. And so then the big question is, of course, you know, is there a classification of all such processes, processes that are, you know, scale invariant, rotation invariant, have some Markov property. Um, and in two dimensions, there is to some extent, because there are these objects that people call conformal field theories, uh, and they essentially describe these kind of objects, or at least describe their correlation functions. Um, and so in two dimensions, quite a lot is known, or at least conjectured uh, for many of these models. And, but unfortunately, this is a very two dimensional thing, right? So somehow the conformal symmetry is a very rich symmetry in two dimensions. So you can get a lot of mileage out of it. Uh, but it's not as useful say, in three dimensions. Or for example, if you look at space-time models, well, then there's no symmetry between space and time in general. Maybe there's Galilean symmetry, but it's not, it's very different from the conformal symmetries. Um, so there's one class of models that people have, probabilists have been uh, studying for the last maybe 20 years or so. Um, which is that of one plus one dimensional models. So that would be, you know, models where there's one space dimension and one time dimension. And um, so the kind of model, well, I'm going to show you in a second what kind of models I'm thinking about. Um, but so here, it, it turns out that there are three natural universality classes that have been sort of identified. So there's one which is called Edwards Wilkinson. So this is again a Gaussian one, and I'm going to show you in a second examples of the sort of models that are in that universality class. There's a generic one, which is called the Kaldar Parisi Jan KPZ universality class. Uh, and that has, had, has been studied a lot uh, over the last 10 years. Um, and that is, expected to be the generic one in the sense that, you know, if you take a one plus one dimensional statistical mechanics model of some kind of height function, and your model depends only on the shape, so the evolution of your height function is random, is somewhat local, 
And it only depends on the shape of the value and all of it of the function around the location, but not on its actual value, right? So in the sense that if you translate H by a constant, then you let it evolve. It should be the same as first letting it evolve and then translating it by the same constant. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that you expect if you have, if H describes, you know, some kind of interface between two regions, um, as long as the evolution of that interface only depends on what happens at the interface, then you would expect it to be given by a model like that. So you don't care about the absolute position of the interface in order to see how it evolves. You only care about its shape. Um, and very recently with a collaborator, we've discovered, if you want, uh, a third universality class here, which we call the Brownian castle. Uh, I'm going to show you in a second uh, where that shows up. And then a question here is again, so if like you have these three universality classes, so then how large are their basins of attractions? Or like, you know, how many models fall in each of these classes? Um, and so here's an example of model for this Edwards Wilkinson class. So that's the simplest class, the Gaussian one. Uh, so here, what happens is you, you know, your height function is function from integers to integers. Again, as before, as in the case of the random walk, uh, it's constrained to always change by exactly plus or minus one, and the, but it evolves over time now. So this is not time, this is space, okay? Uh, and the way it evolves over time is that if you want that every instant of time, you pick one location, say this one, and then if it's a local maximum, you turn it into a local minimum, right? So here it's a local maximum. And so you flip it around. So you turn it into that. Uh, if you choose this location here, that's a local minimum, then you flip it around the other way. Um, if it's neither, then you just leave it as it is. You do nothing, okay? And here there's a theorem, if you take that model, well, it has a limit and the correct way of rescaling it is this with these exponents one, two, and four. Um, and the limit can be completely described um, and it has certain symmetries. Um, there's another model which is called ballistic deposition. So this one, you should think of like bricks falling from the sky and they pile up uh, like that, but <clears throat> but the ways they can also stick to neighbors. So if a brick falls down here, it doesn't fall down all the way to here, but it actually sticks to its neighbors here, right, like that. Okay, and then you ask yourself, how does that behave um, <clears throat> after a long time? Uh, so here I can actually show you um, a simulation. So this here is a simulation of this, right? So this is exactly the same as what I showed you before, but just there are many bricks and they fall down very fast. So you can actually zoom out here uh, and you see something like that. All right, so now here you have like millions of bricks, already that fell down. And so you see this kind of interface at the top, um, which, you know, evolves over time and you can ask yourself can you describe you know the limit that you get here um so that turns out is an extremely hard problem so there's no theorem no mathematical theorem whatsoever there is a conjecture um and the conjecture is that it converges to an object which is called the kpz fixed point but even that conjectured limit was only built, it was described only about four years ago. So there's a paper by uh, Matsetsky, Quastel, and Remenick that came out, well, it was actually published this year, I think, or last year, but it was put on archive about four years ago. So, okay, so this is like super recent result, but the, the recent result doesn't even say anything about this model. It only describes, if you want, the limit that you conjecture this model to have. Um, and then there's another example, which is 
called the Branian Castle. So that one, there is a description of it, which is somewhat similar to this model here, um, but it's a bit easier. So what happens, you see here, what do you, if you choose a location X and at a given time you have, you know, this function H of X. So H is somehow the top of this line, right? So it's the topmost brick. Then what is the new value for H? Well, it's the max between H of X minus one, H of X plus one and H of X plus one, right? Because either the new brick falls down, either it goes all the way to the existing brick, and then the new value is H of X plus one, or there is a higher brick on the right, and then it sticks to that one, and then the new value is H of X plus one, or there is a higher brick on the left, and it sticks to that one, and then the value is H of X minus one. And what happens is the first thing that happens as you fall down, and so therefore it's the maximum between these three values. Right? So another thing you can do now is instead of taking the maximum of the three here, you just take one of them at random. And then if you do that, uh, then you get something like this. Right? So that's now what you do if you change the max uh, by simply taking one of the three values at random. And so you see here, you get again some sort of interesting behavior at large scales, but it's quite different, right? So here you see these quite tall powers, right? With pretty high jumps between them. Um, and so that's why here we call the scaling limit. Um, so here there's a graphical construction of this process, which I think I don't have time anymore to uh, to explain, but with this graphical construction, it is actually quite easy. It's not a hard theorem. So in this case, it's actually relatively easy to prove uh, that this model where you choose these values at random instead of taking the max has a limit and you can figure out what the scaling exponents are uh, and you can describe completely the limit. And the limit is you know, sp some space time process, which is discontinuous. Uh, so that's because, well, you somehow see it on this simulation already, right? That the, it looks like the limit is going to be discontinuous because you see these kind of quite large jumps uh, in the simulation. So you can actually prove that rigorously. Uh, and you can, you can actually give a rather detailed description of the scaling limit in this case. So, so the picture now here is now, if you want, if you look at the space of all one plus one dimensional interface models. So we have these three prototypical examples. So I show, showed you these three examples that converge to either Edwards Wilkinson, KPZ or the Brownian castle at large scales. And so in some sense, the conjecture is that in the space of all models, the situation is a little bit like this cartoon. So what does this cartoon show? So it shows that this KPZ universality class, so the, the arrows here is the operation of zooming out, okay? Like what I did in all these simulations. So I do a simulation at, large, at small scale, but then you zoom out and you look at what happens, you know, when you take many, many sites and you look at it uh, at large scales. So the arrow here is the operation of zooming out in the space of all, models and these models here they are self-similar so they are invariant under the operation of zooming out so they are if you want fixed points of the operation of zooming out right and this kpz fixed point the conjecture is that this one is the most stable one so like if you come up with a model you know more or less at random if you want uh, then chances are that it's going to be in this KPZ universality class. But then if you, if you add additional symmetries, then you can make sure that it actually converges to this Edwards-Wilkinson. So that's supposed to be the 
next most stable, if you want, universality class here. Um, whereas this Brownian castle class, which we've identified very recently, uh, that one is expected to be much less stable. Right? So it's, uh, and that's also one of the reasons why you don't usually see it if you just write down a model at random. Right? Uh, is because it's actually, it's really not very stable. Um, now, the interesting thing here is that one also expects to have like connections between these universality classes. And so in particular, there would be connections between Edward Worthkinson and the KPZ universality class. And this connection has a name. So the conjecture here is that there is exactly, that this is one dimensional. So there is exactly one model which has the property that if you zoom out, it converges to the KPZ equation. And if you zoom in, it converges to Edwards Wilkinson. Um, and that's called the KPZ equation. So, so that is one model. And so that's called the KPZ equation. Um, and the conjecture is that there is really just one. There is nothing else that has that property. And so that stated as it is, that general, the, this is a conjecture, not a theorem, but we have now theorems that you know, go very much in this direction, right? That show that you, know, you can look at somehow very large classes of models that are in the KPZ universality class and that have one instance uh, that have like depend on a parameter and for one value of the parameter they are in the Edwards Wilkinson class and then you take the value of the parameter close to that and then if this cartoon is correct if you start from something close to Edwards Wilkinson but not quite then you should actually see uh, this KPZ equation and we can prove that for pretty large classes of models now, right? So this goes quite a long way uh, to proving this conjecture here. Uh, interestingly, between this Brownian castle and Edwards Wilkinson, we can also prove, we can construct processes that live on a line like that. So that has the property that at large scales, they behave like Edwards Wilkinson, at small scales, they behave like the Brownian castle. But this, we can actually construct an infinite dimensional family of them. So, so this red line, if you want, is not a line, but it's an infinite dimensional manifold. Wow. Okay, so, so it's somewhat interesting in this RG picture where you have these fixed points, but like between these two, the conjecture is that there is exactly one line and there is nothing else basically. Whereas between these two, there's a whole infinite dimensional family of models. Uh, that connect them. So, yeah, so I hope that, well, this, I think I found this very interesting. Uh, I hope you find this interesting as well. Um, and, well, I suppose maybe, maybe one conclusion here is that, well, as you, as you could see that there, there are in some sense many more conjectures than results here. Uh, and so there are lots of things that are still to be discovered. Um, well, thank you very much for your attention. That's about Martin again. That was really amazing lecture, Martin. Uh, that's another uh, show you that you, you really uh, structure this show that the house models that they uh, cut first to something that is a basic attraction. That's really something. So uh, before we open a question of the, uh, sorry, a session for a question and answer. Uh, I would like to uh, give a, some time to, for the, a break. Here's some, some um, little music from the Antum. Uh, maybe we in turn will uh, introduce the Antum sessions. But before we start the music, uh, if you have any questions regarding the talk or a question to Professor uh, Herer, please write it down and you're in the chat. I will, uh, I will read the questions and let the uh, uh, Professor Herer uh, answer the questions. Okay, so I will let uh, Intan to, to take over. 
Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Bayudi. And also thank you, Martin, for a very nice lecture. Um, could you please uh, take uh, your slide? Okay, so this is an Angklung performance from uh, ITB students. So Angklung is a, a traditional uh, instrument from uh, West Java. And uh, the song is called uh, Manuk Dadali. is uh, the song about uh, our uh, uh, symbol of Indonesia. So our uh, symbol is uh, a bird that looks like an eagle. Uh, in Bahasa Indonesia, we call it Garuda. But uh, in uh, Sundanese, uh, it is Manuk Dadali. And this song is about uh, how great this uh, bird uh, protecting our country. Okay, so I will uh, present here uh, Manuk Dadali in Angklung. Thank you for watching. So actually, uh, Angklung is played by uh, this uh, bamboo instrument, but uh, now with the pandemic situation, uh, they becoming very innovative and play it with handphone. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great. <laughs> okay. Bye, Yudi. Yeah, thank you, Intan. Um, let's see. Okay, there's some uh, question already. So. I will uh, read uh, some of the questions. Okay, uh, this is from uh, Professor Budi Nurani. Thank you. Uh, thank you for very much your presentation. If you don't mind, can you give explanations for the third conclusions? Uh, okay, so I think that was the fact that uh, so the belief in and mathematical justification of universality justifies the study of simple toy models linked seemingly very distinct system. Um, yeah, so the, so the idea is that, well, you know, so if you believe that universality statement, right, which says that there are relatively few um, large scale limits that can possibly show up, then in order to describe uh, all of these limits, you would want to find 
the simplest possible model mm. that has that you know object as its large scale limit right and so so that's a justification of if you want looking at the simplest possible models that you can f- write down even if they don't you know a priori appear to have an obvious you know, maybe physical significance or so, right? So they would be like all the, these little toy models that I showed you with the bricks. Um, nobody would believe that, you know, there's an actual physical model that really does that, right? But at large scales, there would be, you know, real physical models that show the same behavior as these little toy models. Uh, and so it's still important as mathematicians to study these little toy models so that we can kind of figure out what are the possible limits you can get, what is their behavior, and so on. Mm-hmm. So I see to the second questions. Uh, the second question is from Lawrence Vijaya. Is the behavior of Ising model in higher dimension similar to the two-dimensional one? Also, beside KBC, EW, and uh, BC Castle, Brownian Castle, does there exist any known model related to KBC? Um, okay, so so the first question is well, okay, so it depends on what you mean by similar. So the, so there's okay, so the fact that there is a phase transition, right? Uh, so that there is a low temperature phase in which you see mostly, you know, all the spins aligned and the high temperature phase where you see them disordered. So that is true in every dimension uh, for the easing model. Now, at the critical temperature, you expect to have a interesting behavior in three dimensionals. Also in three dimensions, there should be a scaling limit, which is non-trivial and uh, but one doesn't, much less is known. So in two dimensions, one knows, for example, what are the correct exponents to use for the scaling limit. In three dimensions, that's not known. You can do numerical simulations. There are approximations to these exponents. And there's actually also some semi-rigorous, semi-heuristic way of computing these exponents. Uh, So it's known to now probably five or six digits, but uh, but there is no closed form formula and there is no proof that there is actually a scaling limit in three dimensions, even though it's conjectured. Uh, in four dimensions, Eisenman and Hugo Dumineil Cotin have shown like last year that every scaling limit is Gaussian. So in that sense, in four dimensions, you don't expect, uh, so the, the easing model you expect it to be the same as the either free field or just white noise, even at the critical temperature, right? So you don't expect interesting behavior even at the critical temperature at large Mm. scales. And in higher dimensions, this was already known since the 80s. So there was old work by Bridges and Freudich um, and Eisenmann who proved that already in dimensions five and higher. So, so, and that's a somewhat, a uh, generic fact is that many of these models um, have a critical dimension and then above the critical dimension, they tend to behave in a somewhat trivial way. So they tend to, so even if you write down an interacting model in high enough dimension, it tends to behave like a free one, right? So it just becomes Gaussian in a way. Uh, and it's only in lower dimensions that you actually see non-trivial large-scale behavior. Um, And then I think the the other question was, is there another known model related to KPZ? Well, to KPZ fixed point, yes. So there is a, so for example, I gave you that first model, the one where you have these random walks and you turn local maximum into local minimum and local minimum into local maximum. So if you take that same model, but you only turn local minima into maxima, Right? You only go up, you never go down. Okay? Mm-hmm. So if you take that model, uh, then that is proven to be in this KPZ universality class. So this is actually the model that uh, Matetsky, Quastel, and Remenik studied in the paper that I mentioned. Right? So it's for that model. That model 
has some kind of exact integrability structure. So you can compute lots of things exactly and you can actually take limits. Um, and there are lots of other models of which one conjectures that they belong to this KPZ universality class. And for some of them, there are partial proofs. So there's a whole bunch of models that were studied by you know, people like Corwin and Borodin and Costell also, uh, Johansson and so on, where you know, they prove not a full convergence to this KPZ fixed point, but partial notions of convergence. And next questions from Hino Lugo. Uh, can we use universality as a guiding principle to study turbulence where we can find some kind of phase transitions between laminar and turbulence flow? If you have some work experience. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I think that's, that's a big dream of fluid dynamicists. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, I mean, yes, in the sense that people believe, if you want, that there, there should be a sort of ideal, there should be like an idealized mathematical model of fully developed turbulence, right? mm -hmm. uh, which should be somewhat universal. Um, but, you know, yeah. People know nothing about it, basically. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can have somewhat guesses about scaling exponents from Kolmogorov laws, but mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I think people know very, very little about that. So, yeah, but but yes, I mean that that's certainly one of the dreams. And yes, I mean, so it is precisely that universality principle that leads people to believe that there is, if you want, one universal mathematical object of fully developed turbulence, right? But, but nobody has any idea of how to say anything interesting about that object. <laughs> Next question from Muhammad Ismail Yunus. Uh, he's uh, asking from the experience from the static, statistical mechanics, how do we know about the stability around these fixed points in the space of models? Do we delve around renormalization groups, flows, and calculations? Right. Yes. Yeah. So that that's okay. So that these uh, RG flow calculations that people do, they study the stability of the Gaussian fixed points. So for the Gaussian fixed points. Um, Typically, what you do is you. Uh, let me see. So I can actually, I can can just share my screen again. Um, can give you some sort of cartoon of what people do, All right? So, like um, these these Gaussian problems, they are described by Gaussian measures. So they are typically measures like this free field measure. So formally. These are sort of measures like that, right? So they have like, so formally it's the measure that has density, you know, e to the minus something like gradient phi square where phi is your free field, right? So you have something like that. And then you can ask yourself, you know, what happens if I add here plus other monomials in phi, right? So you can add maybe you know, phi to the four, or you can add, I don't know, phi grad phi. Well, that one is maybe not so nice because it's, it doesn't have the right symmetries. Um, but, you know, you can sort of start to add additional terms here. Um, and then you can ask yourself, you know, if I do some rescaling, if I do a rescaling, which keeps this term the same, how do these terms behave under rescaling? Right? Um, and that would be like a first order if you want RG calculation. And then of course there are, there are some situations where these terms would also be unchanged and then you can go do it like second order calculations and so on. Um, and so that's what people do in order to figure out if you want the stability of these uh, Gaussian fixed points. For the non-Gaussian ones, I don't know if there's a good systematic way of studying their stability. 
So for example, for this thing about the Brownian castle, you can, um, I mean, you can do some kind of formal calculations that are a little bit similar, that have a little bit of a similar flavor. Uh, and that suggests that it's very unstable somehow. Um, and, but for example, for this, the fact that you have this kind of infinite dimensional family, which is unstable, if you want, from the Brownian castle, that one we just constructed by hand. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not very systematic. <laughs> Uh, next question is uh, from uh, Professor Bobby Gunara. Does this universality exist in ADS, uh, the CFT, where CFT is in two dimensions? Um, well, okay, so, so first I'm not all an expert on that. <laughs> um, now, my understanding is that so so yes there is a there's this correspondence between anti de Sitter space uh, and conformal field theory, um, but that's a different thing, right? So it's it's a correspondence. So it's essentially um, like you know taking one single mathematical object and looking at it from different points of view, and then what you realize is that actually. You know there are there are two things that you thought were somewhat unrelated, but they are actually in some sense, uh, you know, two points of view of the same mathematical object. So that's this ADS CFT correspondence. Now the universality here is more about the fact that, um, in some sense, in two dimensions you expect well there are the CFTs they are parametrized by a central charge, so you have this one parameter family of models, um, and you'd expect that whenever you have a model, a 2D model of statistical mechanics, if it has a scaling limit that is somehow conformal invariant, then you would expect it to be one, you know, of this one parameter family of CFTs. Um, so the, that's more the universality statement, right? Uh, next question is, uh, from Ricky Reza Fauzi. Uh, it is perhaps a crazy question. Do you think we perhaps can explain mean median map or three n plus one conjectures by Brownian motions? And somehow I see how the orbit of MMM looks very similar to the sample path of Brownian motions. Uh, okay, I not sure what the mean median map is. So I don't think I can answer that question. <laughs> um, I mean, there are, you know, there are many things, you know, there are many deterministic like recurrence relations that give you essentially pseudo random numbers, right? Mm. Uh, and so then of course, you know, so that means that you can come up with, in some sense, many recurrent deterministic recurrence relation where a typical trajectory would actually look like a typical trajectory of, uh, of Brownian motion. Um, but that's again, right? So it's, it's because you would, if you have any system which is somehow sufficiently fast mixing, right? If you have good enough mixing properties then you know things decorrelate sufficiently fast. Then you actually have a functional central limit theorem. It means that Brownian motion is not fast. Well, right? So, so I'm not sure if that question can goes in that direction, but you know, well, it might. I think uh, that is the the last questions. I think I uh, think we should. And the, the, the lecture sessions. So I would like to thank again Professor Martin for the very fascinating le lectures of the a preview of the of a landscape we've never imagined of those kind of thing, <laughs> dynamical system thing. So thank you again, and uh, I would like to uh, return the session to Pa Edi. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Pa Edi. So uh, uh, <clears throat> thanks again to uh, Professor Martin Herrier.
for wonderful and inspiring uh, lecture. So we are very happy to have you uh, in this program. And on behalf of ITB, uh, we would like to uh, give you some uh, certificates. Let okay. me show you the certificate of this uh, program. Uh, this certificate is signed by our rector. And also we give you some uh, uh, small to token of appreciation. Let me share the screen. Okay. Okay, so this is the certificate uh, for this uh, program. And uh, again, uh, on behalf of the ITB, Sisu Technology Bandung, we like to thanks, thank you, Professor Harriet. This is a certificate signed by our rector. And then uh, this certificate is also an invitation to you uh, for coming to Bandung. So uh, whenever you are uh, free, <laughs> please let me know, yeah? Okay. So we, we like to arrange your uh, visit to come to Bandung. And also uh, we will give you some <laughs> Uh, drawn, uh, drawing, drawing of uh, of your uh, photo. This is drawn by computer by my our students actually, and hopefully you enjoy this uh, photo uh, sketch of the photo. And also the last one, but not least, this is uh, the real uh, painting, caricature, <laughs> caricature of you. You are now already at ITB by visually. So in the background, actually our, uh, 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 our Aula Barat, yeah? uh, our uh, West uh, Hall of the, the logo of, not the logo, but the, I mean, the symbol of uh, ITB. So whenever you are arriving in ITB, you will see this is the first building, uh, historical building <laughs> at ITB. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I will send you all these uh, uh, two photos to, uh, and also the certificate uh, electronically. Uh, but this real painting, uh, hand painting, this, this one is actually hand painting, uh, uh, <clears throat> made by our artists and also uh, our lecturer. Uh, at the art of uh, at the art department of uh, ITB, so uh, hopefully we can send you uh, this uh, painting, uh, the hard copy, mm -hmm. to England. Oh, thank you very uh, much. One, one of our colleagues, uh, Doctor Nofriana, uh, promised me to hand over to you this uh, painting. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so therefore uh, we come to the end of uh, this program. And again, thank you to Professor Harrier, Harrier and also uh, Professor Rennie, our rector, and also uh, our dean, Professor Wahyu, and of course to all the committees yeah, and to all the participants. So uh, see you again uh, next uh, program. Yeah, hopefully on June we will have uh, the second uh, edition of this uh, program. Okay, so see you all. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Terima kasih. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Semuanya terima kasih. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Pak Edi. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Pak Rudi, please uh, dimatikan uh, rekamannya. Okay.